Growth Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Travel Growth Podcast. I'm Tom McLaughlin, founder of SEO Travel, and this is where I speak to successful travel business leaders and dig into the successes, challenges, and learnings from their experiences over the years, so you, the listener, can take away actionable advice to enhance your own businesses and maybe even lives too. My guest today is John O'Kelly. John is the founder of Loot, an agency that provides consultancy, branding, and content creation services to luxury travel businesses. He was also previously the luxury travel editor at the Telegraph Media Group, and he oversaw all their luxury travel content during that time. He continues to write for some of the leading luxury travel publications internationally, including the Financial Times, The Times, Departures, and Rob Report. John's insight into the world of luxury travel is fascinating, and it comes from someone who's now seen it from many angles. We discussed some of the incredible experience he had during his time at The Telegraph, which are absolutely mind-blowing, um, such as being able to first stay in the world's first fully underwater hotel room, as well as getting to the core of what makes good travel writing and also what doesn't, which John has a very good perspective on. John shares some excellent tips on how to get coverage in the kind of publications he's worked at and how to deal with journalists in an effective and respectful way, which includes the difference between pitching to staff writers and freelancers, which you might not have come across before. There's also some very practical insight into branding and what that means in the real world, rather than just what colours you use on your website and what your logo looks like from the work that John's done with many hotels around the world in particular. And that was, again, really fascinating stuff. But the thing that I enjoyed most in this conversation was how candid John was. He's a straight talker and he clearly doesn't pull any punches when explaining how he works. And that's been clearly a big contributor to his success over the years with his, with his writing and the work that he's done. He's also got some very surprising insight for budding travel journalists that you might want to listen out for. I'm sure that any travel company listening to this will absolutely love it as it's full of ways that you can get your brand out there in the press and actions that you can jump on right away. And not only that, just the background that it gives into the world of the press, journalism and just luxury travel in general is uh, is super interesting. So yeah, here's me with John O'Kelly. Enjoy. John, hello. Welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Thank Thanks you. for coming on. It's great to have you and I'm really looking forward to, to diving into your experience, uh, both setting up and, and running Loot and then also your background, obviously, at The Telegraph and, and what, what you've learned from that. And I'm sure there's lots of people listening who would love to get into The Telegraph and be featured in the kind of things that you were writing. So, uh, so yeah, I'd love to dive into that with you. So, so really looking forward to it. Great. Happy to help. Um, I thought we could start with yeah, kind of back to the beginning and maybe you could give us a bit of an overview of the journey from maybe like education up to getting to the Telegraph, like what led you there, what you, what you did, how, yeah, how, how did you get there? Well, uh, regarding education, that's such a long time ago. I know we went to the same university, but I can barely remember it. So uh, through a series of misadventures, although I'm from the west of Ireland, I ended up accidentally in England. Uh, lost various jobs, didn't know what I wanted to do, found myself in Manchester, figured I should go back to university, did uh, right before the financial crash, just did a benign, innocuous degree that didn't really mean anything, assuming I get a great job as soon as I graduate it. That didn't go to plan either. And when I uh, did graduate, I was um, just figuring out what I wanted to do, decided to move down to London as an alternative to Manchester, which was very familiar to me at that stage, uh, had been told I was good at writing, did love to travel, glued the two words together, tried to pursue becoming a travel writer. A very arduous, unrewarding task, you know, initially, in fact, for quite a long time, for anyone who's considering um, a career in travel writing or travel journalism, my current advice is to not do it because it's not sustainable as a freelancer to earn a living. I think, you know, the initial allure, you know, the idea of traveling the world is incredibly intoxicating and exciting. Um, the way the industry is structured means that certainly if you're living in an expensive city like London, you won't earn enough uh, to do that long term. Uh, so I did it. I um, interned prolifically, often unpaid, trying to get a reputation established at the same time I was wasering in Pizza Express, uh, serving a lot of bankers in Bishopsgate. So definitely was very, very trying initially. 
finally started to build up a portfolio which allowed me to incrementally increase the caliber of publications I was contributing to and ultimately that culminated in me getting a job during the Olympics period as the, after various other jobs as the London editor for The Telegraph and I oversaw all uh, London related travel, lifestyle and culture content during that seismic, brilliant, exciting year for the city when it was so different a decade ago than the type of environment we're living in today. So that was a really wonderful introduction, you know, there was so much optimism. London as a subject matter provided so much material to engage with, you know, it's an incredibly diverse, inexhaustible city. Um, and then that went quite well. And at the at the point that that role was coming to a conclusion because the Olympics period had ended itself, um, the Telegraph had decided that they wanted to include the luxury travel section. I was approached to do the role um, based on how well things had gone with London. I was very happy to accept that opportunity. And then we developed from scratch the luxury travel section within the Telegraph. What's interesting about the Telegraph um, as a publication is that obviously it's associated with a prosperous readership. So we were creating content for people who could actually afford to go on these holidays, which was an interesting position to occupy because often a lot of extreme luxury content is incredibly aspirational and presented with the assumption that people won't actually do it. So you're talking about like the world's best dreamy penthouse suites and stuff like that, but they're extortionate. They're 50,000 pounds a night in some cases. You know, it's just for all of us to gawk at. Um, this would be more at the level for, as you know from your role as well, Tom, for people who do spend 20,000 pounds on a holiday. And I know that's an astronomical amount, but you know, there are people who do do that. So this was a resource that became very popular with that broad global community because it was English speaking. And as a result of that, I had the opportunity with my own role to commission a lot of very credible writers to write about these things, but also myself go around the world and experience what was developing in that economy. Um, and it was a very exciting role to occupy for quite a few years. So that was the Telegraph stuff and my journalism stuff. I, I feel like I should just continue talking to, to wrap this long story up. I, yeah, no, I've got a couple of, before we, before we take it on from there, I've got a, I mean, it's interesting when yeah. you're saying about the, um, you know, kind of not recommending going into that. My, so I did an English degree and my dream was always going into sports journalism and I almost did a journalism degree in the first instance, but decided I'd broaden it up a little bit. And yeah, basically I went through and did the degree and then thought, oh, what do I do now? And it was like, yeah, go and be a tea boy in a newsroom. And yeah, the journey is long. And like you say, not, not very rewarding for, for a long time, if ever. So, um, so I was, I was too work shy at that point. So I ended up going and working in PR. That's what that kind of took me off that, off that tangent. Um, yeah. the, so, so you, yeah, with the, with the Telegraph stuff, tell, tell us a little bit more about, about life there. Like how, how does that look when you're, kind of in there, I guess once you've got to the, whether it was when you were doing the London stuff, but I guess that was maybe kind of a bit of a microcosm with all the Olympic stuff going on. But once, you know, once you're onto the travel desk, what, how does that work? Give us a bit of a view behind the scenes as to, to what it looks like when, you know, day to day. Well, you know, while I would caution people specifically to pursue freelance travel journalism, for me as a staff member on this very reputable title with a brilliant travel team, it was, you know, just a positive experience. And I, I love travel and I love communicating about it, which is why my current position, which we'll talk about later, is so embedded in that still. Working in, you know, the hub of a global media organization for anyone is just amazingly inspiring and completely fascinating. You know, being at the epicenter of where huge stories break and are communicated globally, there's this intoxicating energy to the place. Regarding travel, what I really appreciate about The Telegraph is that it was taken very, very seriously. So um, a lot of publications might have just two or three people randomly rewriting press releases we always had a sense when I was there, and you know, obviously it's still the case that people's holidays are extremely precious and a lot of emphasis was given to ensuring they were making informed choices that were appropriate for them, which meant having informed professional journalists uh, review and carry out our content strategy. So a great, great initiative they had there is introducing a global network of travel experts. So for example, if we were looking to publish content relating to Sydney or Rio, that it would be a specific individual who was ordinarily based there or living in the country that had local context and also was greatly immersed in the destination year round, rather than someone who's just parachuted in, has a nice time and then writes out. So that um, was a very, very successful strategy. 
I constantly heard from people I met socially that they use the Telegraph specifically its hotel reviews as a resource all the time. And while I was there, it had a really expansive global reach. So um, it was great to work there. We were really interested in telling proper stories about places around the world. Um, I worked with really brilliant, intelligent people who love to travel like me. So, you know, that was all really, really positive. Regarding luxury, um, I was very conscious when I was writing about that or commissioning content to be um, extremely demanding with the places that we were experiencing because, you know, for regular people on, you know, the British average salary, if you're going to a resort in the Maldives where a holiday costs £50,000 for a week, of course you're going to be amazed. Um, but on that basis, I, I think it still needs to be absolutely exceptional. So if food wasn't up to scratch or service was bad, I found that extremely annoying and I was very insistent that we criticize these places for their shortcomings because you're not entitled to mess up when you're charging that much yeah. to people. And of course, as well, when you're talking about luxury experiences too, I recognize that there's a very, very privileged echelon of people who always stay in nice places and, you know, they go for a Michelin star meal once a month versus people that will be a little bit more familiar to the rest of us who, you know, it's their 20th wedding anniversary or it's their honeymoon. And this is the one big trip. So I really hated fluffy travel journalism where it was saying everything is perfect, you know? So it really, if things are shortcomings, they needed to be highlighted because I always had those people in mind that this was the one dream trip that they would remember for the rest of their lives. Love it. Don't, don't mess with John was the message. If someone, if he's coming. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be frank, it was really interesting for me to hear from other people in the industry that they were a bit worried about me going to places, <laughs> apparently because I, you know, I would honestly say if I didn't like things, I don't yeah. think it should be a matter of being afraid of me. I'm just disappointed that I'm a minority of sorts in taking that approach to what I write. And certainly yeah. I would read, uh, you know, I don't want to denigrate anyone, but I would read certain reviews of places I'd stayed in that I knew to be lackluster and they would rhapsodize about how wonderful it was. And I got really annoyed about that. I felt it yeah. wasn't fair to people who trusted that publication. Yeah, exactly. Like you say, for people who are going for a once in a lifetime trip and they read that and they think this is where I should go and then it doesn't live up to expectation. Exactly. You have to assume that you're writing for people who are actively interested in pursuing this activity themselves or staying in this property. So I don't know why you would would ever kind of big something up that didn't deserve it. Anyway, that, yeah, that was yeah. my approach. Yeah, nice. And and so just give us a quick uh, an idea of a couple of the. I'm sure there's myriad crazy stories and things that you did during that time. Like give us a, give us a couple of insights, a couple of a couple of stories from from while you were doing those those big extravagant things. I'm, I'm I will do that, but I'm I'm going to couch this by saying you know while these were my work trips and I was very excited and privileged to be able to do those things uh you know in real life <laughs> my, my approach is a lot more humble <laughs> and I love I love for example just going on a driving holiday in the west of Ireland where I'm from just spontaneously seeing where we end up or going to a pub versus to a cocktail bar is my private preference but you know it's very useful for work when you go to places like cocktail bars and posh hotels because um they're real, a distillation of the creative ambitions the property has. So you can see with the way they develop the menu, the ingredients they use, the techniques that they cultivate, you know, how the service is, it gives you a good snapshot of the property as a whole. So that said, I will now go into a list of really nice things I've done. And, um, you know, the highlight trip for me of my life, in fact, the best trip I've ever been on that I will never surpass was um, going around Antarctica for a week aboard a retrofitted Russian icebreaker. And this is kind of um, a halfway point in terms of its size between a regular small cruise ship and a, a small boat that wouldn't really be safe to use in such a perilous setting. And the benefit, you know, beyond the privilege of exclusivity that you get with that is that you're allowed access through your size into kind of isolated coves and very otherwise impenetrable regions that larger ships couldn't reach. And of course, you also have more flexibility because there's fewer passengers on board just to spontaneously stop and get out if you see uh, some type of natural phenomenon that is of interest to you. So Antarctica is the most beautiful, incredible, thought-provoking place I've ever been. Um, an interesting experience for me as someone who, through work, frequently got to go to the Maldives was to stay in a place called the Maraca. I don't know if you've heard of it, Tom. No, no, I don't think so. No. So the Maraca, it's found within Conrad Ringali Maldives, so the Conrad Resort, which is one of the first international resorts to ever open in the country. 
Uh, years ago, they opened something that was quite famous. It was like an underwater restaurant. So then they manipulated mm -hmm. or modified the technology that existed to create that, to create something called Maraca, which they build as like the world's first fully underwater hotel suite. In actuality, what it is, they built like a Palm spring style bungalow, which they place on stilts uh, far away from the resort's edge. You reach it through an isolated pier. Uh, you have this palatial suite with a beautiful infinity pool and yoga terrace and all that, butler's quarters. And then beneath it, there's a stairwell, as far as stairwell or an elevator going downstairs uh, into down into the seabed five meters below. And then there's a full, huge hotel suite that has essentially like a glass dome through which you can be completely enveloped by sea life 24 hours a day, removed from reality. So to be in that alien wow. environment without uh, diving equipment on, I remember having a drink on the seabed encased by my glass dome, looking up at the water surface with the sun breaking through it, and then seeing these brilliant beams of golden light cascade through the water. Um, that was a very surreal experience and very, very memorable as well. <laughs> very yeah, uh, discombobulating, yeah. a little bit scary for some people too. I was actually the first ever guest versus hotel staff member or kind of researcher to stay in the property <laughs> and I was staying wow. there by myself and you do have, um, they hadn't, because I had stayed just in opening, they hadn't yet, for example, uh, sorted out the air conditioning. They obviously did it a few days later, but you just hear these little creaks and stuff like that. So being underwater <laughs> by myself away from the main resort um, with no one around, uh, I was a little bit concerned that I'd maybe made a bad decision for a second, but it all went fine. And it's a really memorable place to stay. So for, for me, you know, that was something that was highly distinctive. I felt very lucky to do that. Beyond that, I've just had yeah. a great time going to beautiful places in Asia quite frequently, exploring the best of historic Europe. If I had to go to one holiday destination for the rest of my life, uh, beyond where I'm from in Ireland, it would be uh, Italy, you know, because I think the grand hotels there, the historic hotels there are so incredible. The dining experience is superlative, the culture, the history, the people, the sense of fun, the beaches. So, um, yeah, there's more highlights besides, but I, I might leave. Yeah, that. that could be a that could be an episode. Yeah, an episode in itself, I bet. Um, and yeah. I'm sure, yeah, people, I'm sure can just search for you, search for your your writing, John, as well, and uh, and find lots of good stories from that. So, it's, yeah, like you were saying, fill fill in the uh like the final bit of the of the loop then and tell us tell us what happened from the tele you obviously moved on from the telegraph to to set loop up what what made you do that what made you kind of make that step and then yeah tell us tell us more about loop well i, I left the telegraph in <laughs> summer 2019 and um i was very excited and ready to have a change and um one thing that was of interest to me is that I've been previously approached by people to do consultancy work, but I hadn't pursued it because I wouldn't do anything that might um, compromise my sense of integrity as a journalist, obviously. So I couldn't pursue any other occupations while at the Telegraph, but I wouldn't have wanted to do that. Um, I was excited to potentially pursue these opportunities. And in summer 2019, when I left, I gave myself a few months as an equivalent of maternity leave on the basis that I don't think I'll be available, able to avail of a sabbatical otherwise. And the idea was that I would set up, or rather I did set up this company called Lute, Lute L-U-T-E. The website is lute.co, C-O. I was very happy to get that URL. I felt like it was a good sign, nice and concise. But Lute stands for Luxury Travel Edit. And I saw it as a combination of my skill set. So as a luxury travel editor, um, I have a skill at distilling core aspects of a brand's identity into something that's digestible by the regular consumer public. And also, um, as a consultant, which is something I wanted to pursue, it allows me to again go into a client and get them to recognize what their best capacities and selling points are. So basically, the company Loot, it provides consultancy and content creation services to luxury travel brands or brands who aspire to be in that space. And I work frequently with hotels because you might have a client from company X and they are very good, but they really have lost sight of how they compare to Y, Z. 
um, partially because staying in their competitor set is so expensive, even for people who work for these huge brands, that they might work for hypothetically say four seasons, but they don't really get the chance to stay and see what uh, Mountain Oriental is doing or Peninsula or whatever it might be. I've got a much broader perspective, so I come in try and get them to meet broader industry standards, recognize what trends are forthcoming, uh, what initiatives they should initiate, and also what their unique selling points are and to emphasize those. Or it might be that there's a general hotel group or an individual property that aspires to be in that space, and I advise them on that. So that's what the consultancy has worked with hotels, tourist boards, uh, airlines, uh, aviation groups, um, independent holiday rentals, anything that's basically travel related and aspires to have some type of association with the luxury space. And then additionally, uh, the agency provides content creation services for these brands as well, which might be writing stuff for their website, doing press releases, speeches for CEOs, that type of thing. With the content creation and also the consultancy, one of the things I additionally implement into some of my strategies for some of my clients is utilizing the network of global travel experts that I cultivated while I was at the Telegraph. So as I mentioned, we would commission people from all over the world and again, people with specific specialisms. So I don't have kids, but I would have commissioned someone, I have contacts in fact, who are very immersed in family travel. So if I was working with a client who want to communicate some of their values as they related to that, I would then incorporate uh, some of my contacts so we'd have a really fully fledged um, volume of expertise that they could capitalize on. Yeah, love it, love it. It sounds great. Obviously, we've we've talked a bit in, in background about uh, about what you do and it, it sounds, yeah, it sounds super interesting. And like you say, that network of people being there and on the ground is a, is obviously a massive advantage to kind of elevate um, elevate the content that, that comes out of that. You, you, men yeah. you mentioned, uh, Sorry, go ahead, John, yeah? Well, I was going to say, it's, you know, I just work with loads of brilliant travel journalists and really passionate individuals, and uh, they're an underutilized resource by companies. So, um, you know, these experts who travel the world constantly, um, you know, provide brilliant information all the time and what they produce for regular consumer titles. Uh, I don't feel brands exploit that enough, so it's great to be a conduit and also, as I mentioned, travel journalism in itself isn't a financially viable career for a freelancer. So I'm very happy that as a consultant, I can be a gateway for those individuals to be properly compensated for the work they do if we can find a suitable partnership. So I like to support, yeah. you know, my preferred partners uh, in their own ability to sustain their careers. That's a very gratifying part of the job. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you mentioned, yeah, obviously just kind of helping brands I guess understand their selling points and and guiding them on that 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 process. C can you tell us more about what's involved in that? What do you actually do? So for people who are listening, you know, there's a, a travel company listening, someone you know, a marketing person or a, or an owner of a travel company. What's what's the process of understanding that? What's like what's involved? Yeah, I would like to give you specific examples, but generally they're all governed by NDAs, so I can't. But what I can speak more broadly about is. Um, I think what's been a real revelation for me as someone who comes from a very creative background, you know, working with brilliant journalists and editors who communicate and conceive creative ideas all the time, was as a consultant entering very corporate, commercially minded environments where, frankly, as you can appreciate, your clients as well, people are very financially focused and that's their motivation. So while I appreciate their perspective, what I've had to do a lot of time is try to educate them to recognize we have different motivations, but you know, by both doing our jobs well, you'll reach your objective, which is to earn a lot of money. So, you know, if the guest has a brilliant experience and speaks well about it and wants to return, that's very satisfying for me because I really love the idea of people having a wonderful, memorable, special holiday. It's great for my client because it means they're earning revenue, right? So um, yeah, yeah. what I try to do when I go in with these clients is just shift their perspective a little bit and make them recognize, don't penny pinch, really produce a positive, induce a positive sentiment, a positive feeling and emotion from your clients when they're staying there, because that, you know, I find that wonderful to provide, but for them, that's what they're paying for. And if you do that, so it's about potentially massaging elements of service, making them aware of, you know, if this, I found dealing with a client in Switzerland, for example, they might have a very rigid view of what service is, and then I'll kind of educate them about, well, broader norms across the global travel industry now are such and such. Um, and then as well, in terms of this myopia, I find a lot of my clients, you know, while it's wonderful to work with them, are so 
embedded in what they've been doing for so long that they've lost sight of the potential special things that surround them? Or you might say, what are the partnerships you've cultivated? Who in your community can you engage with? What's the artisan that we can promote? How do we incorporate that into your identity? It's just very refreshing for them to have an outsider come in and validate some of the thoughts they have, but then additionally say, or reject some of the thoughts they have and say, actually, I think you're on the wrong track here. Or then also say, I find really interesting about this region that something, something, something is produced, or this artist is here, or additionally, your setting allows people to do that. I'm astounded time and time and time again, the things I say that seem incredibly, ob almost embarrassingly obvious to me, I'm frequently, I'm saying, I frequently, I frequently kind of proceed to introduce something by first saying, um, I'm sure you've talked about this already, but I just want to <laughs> mention, and then actually eight times out of 10, they haven't thought of it at all. So um, yeah, it's, wow. uh, it's really, really, really good work. It's really good fun. I really enjoy it. And um, then also there's just like lots of nice soft touches. There's so many easy ways to make your property a bit better. Or if you just kind of switch things, pivot things, tweak things a tiny bit, it can make such a huge difference. So also what's great about being a consultant is coming in at a very early level of a concept, developing it from scratch potentially, seeing that investment made as a result of your ideas, and then actually being able to encounter directly firsthand as a consumer is something that I contributed so much to, and then also be present in that environment, see other people enjoying it is really, really great. So it's, um, it's a much more protracted process than writing a story, but it is really, really interesting if people have the time to spare to do it properly and the budget as well, of course. Yeah, it's, that's interesting because I guess what you're saying there to me sounds like very much like kind of real life stuff, like going and changing the real life things that are happening there. Whereas maybe in my head, I was perceiving it as a an onlooker, how to represent yourself to the public in whether it's digitally on your website in to the press. Yeah. So is the what what what's the mix that's of that? And I guess going into that, what's what's a good what makes a good the story side of it for a brand, I guess, that, that, that element to it. That, that, that's totally part of the process as well. And additionally, <coughs> excuse me, another thing I do is I, uh, what I didn't mention is after I left the Telegraph, I now write about luxury travel for a whole range of publications globally, a lot in the US, a lot in Europe. You know, I review properties, for example, for them, but there's another service I provide where I might go into a, ho a hotel and just do a full appraisal. That's not for public dissemination, but which gives a really intricate, uh, assessment of their strengths and weaknesses regarding creating mm. content of course I can do that as well and that you know relates to building stories so um, it's again just going in as a storyteller and kind of recognizing what's really beautiful about your home is that it offers this you know or the special thing I've noted about your property and what can we build from that so that might be initiating new social media strategy it might be providing um, new storytelling elements to be embedded even in the welcome amenities the guests would receive, you know, how you introduce the property in that welcome letter from the manager um, or any of those things. It's very, very flexible. Uh, it's nice to work with clients who are receptive to new ideas. Are, th are there any kind of common threads that always come up? You know, is there anything when you're putting these things together for people and you go and you look and like you say, you kind of survey the, the on the things on the ground or you know you're kind of looking at what they're doing is is there kind of comment again i'm thinking about someone listening and if they're kind of putting the lens back on themselves but what what obvious things are for them to look out for that help will help them do a better story for them build a better story for themselves if they're trying to do that what i know when i engage with clients is why they might be very immersed in their own property or their own brand their own tour operator whatever it is that people don't really scrutinize what the competition is doing. So um, I think we're all locked in our own daily reality with our own business objectives or you know staff problems and things like that. To actually compartmentalize your schedule and take time to step outside of what you're doing directly and look at what the industry as a whole is pursuing currently or what your comp set is up to is very, very valuable. I do think as well, related to that, there's potentially um, a sense of an accurate sense of what their status might be in terms of how they're more they're perceived more broadly because people are so invested emotionally in what they're doing they can't take an objective look at how their competitors are evolving as well so i have 
gone into some clients who've asked, for example, for appraisals of their properties, which I always do candidly. I don't understand what the point of me doing it otherwise would be, um, but are a bit resistant to my thoughtfully expressed criticisms. You know, that um, I, would all, I would never go into, I haven't been to any property that was perfect, so I would never present an appraisal that said anywhere was flawless. However, when people get exposure to the elements that perhaps I need to address, it's very difficult and delicate on occasion, depending on the person I'm working with, to convey that in a way that's constructive. You know, I, I, I always try to convey, convey it constructively, but that will be absorbed in the manner in which it was intended. Those are some of the difficult elements. Yeah, cool. Um, so moving on, you meant, obviously you talked there about having the, the global network and obviously other people that, that you work with. Um, do you have any recommendations, I guess, off the back of what you're doing now or being at the Telegraph, like for running a content team and kind of delivering content at, at scale to, you know, in, in, in various ways? Who, are, who is this being addressed to? What, do you mean a hotel or a, a tourist board or what? Yeah, so I guess, I, I, you know, I'm thinking if, you know, again, just from some of the brands that we work with, if you're a small, a small travel business, you, d you don't have a massive in-house team, for example, maybe you've got one, one writer maybe t to work with, but obviously, you know, particularly from our perspective, we're always recommending more content is good and, you know, kind of try and that will help get you out there more. But um, that's the barrier a lot of the time is the resource isn't there or how do you get good quality output from from doing from you know from from a small you know just having a smaller a smaller team so do you have any yeah I'm looking at it from the perspective of a yeah, smaller travel brand so what what strategies smaller travel brands can implement in order to amplify the efficacy of their content create, creation strategy is that it yeah, 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 that sounds good. So, I, <laughs> I think as you mentioned, um, you know, ideally, loads of brands would be able to create lots of content and it'd be really effective and get the word out there and I'd love to read it and you'd love to see it and all of that. However, it's actually a very defined, uh, important skill and just having someone randomly write a blog, which I think is what some of the smaller travel brands do, um, particularly when you're working in the luxury sector, uh, can be counterproductive. I'll be blunt and say that if I read a, a hotel website and it's got grammatical errors in it, I won't book the hotel. I'll just think uh, as, as a bit of a, a snob about apostrophes and things like that. It just shows a lack of detail. I'll say as well, I don't know, Tom, somewhere here you might have my name written down. I have an Irish, my surname is Irish. I understand nobody can pronounce it. The spelling is quite difficult. The spelling is O apostrophe C E A L L A I G H. When I go into a hotel and they've got the welcome card from the manager that says Mr. O Good, you know, welcome Mr. O'Kelly, um, and it's spelled wrongly, I personally don't care how people spell my name. I don't know them. But when I see I'm staying in a hotel that might be 700 quid a night and they couldn't be bothered to transcribe it properly, I get worried about the whole experience there. So. Um, it really shows a lack of attention to detail. By the same basis, when I'm on a website and, <laughs> and stuff is spelled incorrectly, I don't want to know about it. I also hate really tacky approaches to social media. I think while some influencers are fantastic and have my respect and, you know, are really credible authorities, when you've got, you know, the young blonde with some balloons kind of jumping on the bed of the supposedly posh hotel, I'm instantly turned off. So all these things are need to be considered. And, um, you know, I would say don't automatically try to rush into doing a blog a week or whatever it is just to fulfill some fantasy deadline that you've created on yourself. It's much better to take a step back again with everything. I imagine you say the same things to your clients and uh, consider what this is for. I always ask people, what does success look like to you? Like, why are you doing this? What's the point? Because you can blindly try to follow what you see other people doing, but it's not correct for your brand. With content, make sure you've actually got something worth sharing if you're going to produce it, because I feel completely suffocated by the volume of emails I get. I don't want a newsletter about rubbish and dross. Uh, I would prefer, and this extends to the press releases and emails that I get personally as, as a journalist still, 
I would love to have a relationship with a brand or an individual where I hear about from them once every six weeks, knowing that they've given consideration to what they're producing and it's relevant to me versus getting an email every week saying that they've got a new cocktail on the menu, which is something that we hear constantly as well. So I would caution people yeah. about firstly, uh, feeling a mad need to rush and compromising their quality controls as a result. Specifically for me working in the luxury sector, everything you do should represent the fact that you're a premium brand. Um, then think about what do they actually want to convey about their brand? What's important for them to share? Who's it reaching? Will they be happy to receive the messaging? And do they have time to properly invest in it? You know, not to take it for granted that everyone can write a piece because it's definitely not the case. Yeah, love that. Love that. I Yeah, and I agree, John, with the, yeah, dialing back and thinking about what the purpose is of, of what you're doing. I think that's, you know, often one of the first things we say to people is where, you know, we're obviously coming from it from a, a slightly different angle, often with SEO in mind and trying to, to rank for things. But it's the same thing that, yeah, you look at a blog and they are just clearly someone's told them they have to publish something once a week and they're just throwing rubbish out there. And, and it's like, no, you need to you need to come up with a plan here that will deliver on what you, you want to have and give you some evergreen value from it as well, rather than just it be gone and pushed out the door and forgotten about. Well, in relation to that, I'm actually interested in hearing from you because, you know, I read uh, some pieces of content online where clearly they're using archaic strategies to try and amplify their SEO reach. And they're, you know, it might be in York or something. And it's like, we are one of the best value hotels for cheap family stays in York. And we're very proud, you know, they're just shoehorning in all of those terms. So um, what do you say about, you know, the compulsion to do things like that? How do you create good content when still trying to meet your objectives, you know, essentially it's a commercial enterprise to ensure it ranks well and converts into bookings. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think the, um, yeah, firstly, when we do talk to people about it, we are saying this is for a user. Like you need to think about someone reading this piece. So don't go and just ram it full of keywords and forget about the quality of the, of the writing. It needs to be, it needs to be good at that end point when someone actually reads it, because it doesn't matter if a thousand people read it, if it's garbage, then it will have a negative effect rather than a positive one. I think when you get to the more like keyword style things, essentially we're still using the data, we're still doing the research to find out what people are searching for and what phrases we want to get into an article. But that's changed a lot over the years where historically people would kind of pick one or two phrases and just try and repeat it 17 times in an article and be like, that's the phrase we're trying to rank for. And Google's got yeah. far better now at understanding topics rather than phrases. And so, you know, we look at that whole topic and try to work out, okay, what's the, the broader set of variations that we want to appear in this? So there's not one phrase over and over being put, brought into it. Maybe we've got a set of 20 phrases that we want to appear somewhere. And then that's the challenge for the writer, obviously, is to get that in in a, in a natural way. But you know, that's less of a challenge to do when they're 20 different phrases and, you know, not the same word over and mm. over being being repeated. So I think if you combine those two things, you you tend to get a good impact. And actually the things that help content rank are some of the key details, like what the URL of the page is, for example. Like it's almost like understanding what you want to rank for before you go ahead and write the piece. So, you know, if you give yourself that place to start from and then go and write something really good for a user then you get all those key things in place. So, you know, if it's best family stays at best family hotel in York or something, then you know that's the phrase to start with. That's what's in your URL. You put it in the title tag, but then you go away and you write a really good editorial piece with a bit of a guide of different phrases that you want to appear somewhere within the article. So if you can find that balance, it tends to work. You, you've kind of reminded me it's in, it's interesting excuse me to have this conversation so when i my my consultancy website i mentioned is lute.co l-u-t-e dot co and when i launched it i decided to incorporate an editorial element basically it's really nice for me to have essentially a blog like space where if i see something i like or i've been somewhere i love i could just write about it immediately without having to negotiate with an external title that i don't have full editorial control over and um I occasionally there when I've got time do pieces about new openings and stuff like that. I felt it would be a really valuable resource because that traffic that it would generate would then obviously direct people to the business as a whole. And what's been interesting about that is, you know, versus working for these really preeminent global media 
conglomerates or corporations or, or you know contributing to huge titles internationally was to develop something from scratch and because i was often one of the benefits i found from that is unfortunately because travel journalism has been destroyed globally uh, over the course of the pandemic with people unable to continue to pursue it and also just finding it so heartbreaking um, that there aren't actually that many titles that just talk about really full-on lavish luxury travel stuff so i've been kind of astounded by the, how much traffic has been generated by some of the content i've created for my own site because i was coming from yeah. the perspective of someone who works for huge 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 brands and writes for huge brands versus setting something up myself um and actually uh, the figures have been very very gratifying and uh, worthwhile for me um, but what I found there is essentially if I was writing about a new opening or something like that, the brand might have distributed, Rosewood might say they're opening a new property in Mexico City or wherever it is, everyone will get the same press release. But rather than just regurgitating that, I would write entirely my own take of it using the context and information I already hold within myself. And actually what I was seeing, because then I was doing assessing my competitors, was looking at a lot of people that would essentially copy and paste the press release, which I would never do. And actually, the traffic I get as a result, you know, it seems to be much greater in terms of its ranking and so on. So I just think fundamentally, the core bit of advice I would give everyone is just to maintain quality in everything you do. And as you said as well, think about who's reading it. Don't measure it kind of on the blunt metric of what volume of traffic it gets. What are the conversions? How long do people spend on the page? Does it seem like they come back? You know, ultimately, that's much more useful yeah, yeah. as a resource, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, as I was saying, it's it's. I think often you find people swaying too far one way or the other, and it's kind of like yeah, they just come in with their sort of SEO hammer and don't really care about anything else, and they forget about the quality as a result of it, or they're kind of so brand oriented that they don't take into account the data and the research bit at the start that can help that piece do be way more successful because the quality is there and it's just like some tweaks here and there and a bit of thought beforehand going into it would really kind of uh, elevate how the the probably the longevity and and um yeah the value that it would bring over over time so uh so yeah i would i would echo that john absolutely it, it's good we're on the same page tom and i think um in addition to that i would um encourage people in reference to my earlier point to utilize knowledge and expertise that's available to them, to them externally to recognize producing content or communicating well or writing well is a skill that's valuable. And if you don't have a sufficient or appropriately equipped person within your staff to write this content, do look at which travel writers, freelance are available locally to you potentially. You know, you should have those contacts already. You should already be reaching out to, you know, potential ambassadors who might convey what your brand does to their contacts in turn. And give them some work because I think when you've got a professional doing it and you pay them whatever it is, if you value your time, you should recognize that that's a good investment on your behalf. Um, you know, people try and do everything themselves to save whatever it might be and spend days writing a 400 word press release. You know, you could get that sorted, you know, within a day by one of these people. Yeah, it's better value for you. Absolutely. And that's it. It's looking at cost cost versus value, isn't it? And, and doing it that way. It's uh, yeah, the long term benefit that you get from it is is significantly different. Have you got anywhere that you'd recommend people go to find those those kind of people? Like, yeah, like you say, there's lots of people around the world in destinations that, are, are, yeah, kind of are sat there and, and ready to do the work. How would you go about finding finding those people? Well, obviously, the first thing I'd suggest is contacting me and my email yeah. address is joc at loot.co. But that's, you know, for um, somewhat ambitious, you know, or, you know, if you really want to talk about getting proper experts to do it. Um, but, you know, if you're a local hotel in Harrogate or something, you know, maybe just looking at the British Guild of Travel Writers Association or something like that and seeing who's established locally or just googling travel articles relating to Harrogate and you might discover that someone's based either locally or in Leeds or wherever it might be and seeing you know if they'd be open to that approach but just being resourceful or you know maybe uh, looking beyond that as well it might be that there's some historic element to your hotel and there's uh, you know a local historian that writes beautifully and could craft something so just being again just being a little bit creative and considerate about what you want to pursue and the best way to do it rather than just automatically 
just assigning it to a junior member of the team. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, extra points for using Yorkshire examples as well, John. Thanks for that. Um, the, do you have any, like, just kind of last one on this front, like, I guess, writing tips in general. So, you know, if someone is listening and they want to take on the writing themselves, they want to try and do a bit. Is there, you mentioned attention to detail for that. I'm a grammar Nazi as well. So I'm like, yeah, I'm all over that. Uh, is there anything else that you would throw in there as kind of advice for people if they're, if they want to have a go themselves and try and do it. Yeah, so, so it's, it's kind of interesting timing because this is something I'm dealing with constantly. I have been, I have a client and I am basically correcting uh, their previous partner's editorial work. Uh, and that's uh, partners with the apostrophe after the S rather than before it because they've had multiple, you know, as a grammy, grammy Nazi, you'll appreciate the distinction. Um, they've had multiple bad partnerships. What I find uh, really annoying when I'm being shepherded in to correct frequent problems like this is if you're talking about destination content, these kind of inane attributes that actually say nothing of the destination. So let's say it's a safari experience and you're saying looking at you know the animals at sunset while you're having a sundowner is a magical experience I, i've been on safari i know what they mean it's correct but actually this could be namibia botswana rwanda south africa you know when there's nothing to indicate the real distinct idiosyncratic character of the place that you're trying to sell um that's one of my main things read this if you're writing about your destination or your hotel, read it and implant uh, a competitor destination or a competitor property and say, could this just as equally be about them? And if it is the case, then what you've done is rubbish and you need to correct it. So um, I hate things like, you know, sublime design and exquisite cuisine, because again, what does it look like? What type of food is it? How does it taste? You know, or, you know, a relaxing massage, what, what is your actual spa concept? So that, that's my real bugbear. I'm so bored of reading that type of travel writing. I have zero patience for it. And that's actually one of the benefits as well, because when I'm commissioning people for my commercial projects, writers, I mean, um, you know, I've already filtered them through years of commissioning them editorially. And also they're of a very high caliber and they know not to do that. So in terms of the expediency, uh, it's much better for everyone all around and also investing in that ultimately saves your time and that's a more economical way to pursue it as well even though initially it's obviously going more expensive than getting uh your account exec to do it instead yeah love it love sure it absolutely i think well. yeah absolutely i think it is um like you say the fr the phrase is that basically can just be implanted into anything and tell you nothing uh yeah i think is a yeah. Yeah, a very common thread. Yeah, does my head in. Yeah, so so to, I, I thought maybe we could um, transition into, I guess, the your experience at The Telegraph, but how that can be sort of taken from a, again, from a, from a brand's perspective as to almost like how to try and get coverage in those kind of places. So from a, if, if people are looking at it from a PR perspective, how to go about um, what makes a good story, kind of how to, how to come up with something to, to pitch to a journalist that, that will be interesting and be, and be picked up. Can you give us some insight from the other side of the coin when you're sat there getting you know, drowned in press releases? What, what are the things that make it stand out and make you think, oh yeah, this is something I want to write about? Yeah, uh, well, firstly, I'll just um, commence by saying I'm just speaking generally about titles, not specifically about strategy of the Telegraph or any other publication I contribute to. I'll also mention, you know, it's quite good time that you mentioned this because I have launched um, consultancy sessions for PR agencies and travel brands with a friend of mine, Jenny Sutton, who runs the travel trends forecasting agency, Globe Trender, which you may know and be interested to hear more about, uh, exactly about this. And, you know, together we collaborate and we do it for PR agencies or tourist boards or hotel groups or whatever, because a lot of people feel they've come up with a great story, don't actually know how to get it out there or find alternatively that no one cares. Uh, so it's, um, it's very frustrating if you feel that you've done a good job and you've come up with something 
uh, that people deserve to hear about to find that nobody shares that sentiment. You know, it's a little bit demoralizing, isn't it? But often, often people have an aggrandized idea of what they're doing that isn't really reflected in how the market's moving as well. And that again reflects the consultancy service I mentioned I personally offer earlier where you try and ensure that before they try to sell the story, the story itself is worth selling. So I just think, yeah. you know, firstly, there's practical realities you need to be aware of. There are certain des destinations now that people aren't going to touch for political reasons, very understandably. You know, you could have been working on that project for years. You know, there could be uh, acts of God that are outside your control. It could also be the case that you have really launched something maybe a month after everyone was writing about it for a certain reason, you know? And, you know, at that point, as consumers and also editorial staff, we're completely saturated. We've just had enough where we recognize everyone who wanted to go there has already done so. For example, I went to, I went to Dubai uh, in March for the expo, which was incredible. I just loved it. And I went three times in one week. And, that, you know, it was really, really brilliant. But that was the final month of the expo. It had been on since October. It had already been delayed by two years almost. And then when I got back, it concluded on March 31st. And then I noticed some people were sending uh, press releases about going to Dubai. I was thinking, you really don't have your finger on the pulse at all because, you know, a six month expo that's been seven years in the making rather than five um, has just concluded. So every title that was thinking about doing something with Dubai has anchored it in relation to that, you know, that was the topicality. So yeah. consider topicality, consider timing, considering the resources you can make available to someone that might want to cover it. So if you're sending out a press release, and this is interesting to me, you should definitely make my job as easy as possible because I hate uh, having inquiries with people that ultimately kind of expand into this impenetrable 40 thread email chain when initially I just wanted the prices of the property or how much it costs to go on the holiday. So have the basics integrated into your press communication, cost, availability, duration, where it is, how to get there, that type of thing. Also immediately accessible access to images that you've already cleared internally, um, who's available for interview, that they've been coached properly in a way that they actually communicate like a human. I hate these robotic uh, quotes that are integrated, you know, where such and such is delighted to convey that blah, blah, you know, it's like nobody talks like that. It sounds really alien when I put it on the page. Um, and again, just remember, have something that's genuinely of worth to say. So if you're constantly sending me stories about every inane thing you do, and then two years later, you actually do something good, by that point, I've already unsubscribed or, you know, I'm actually, this is quite remorseless, but post pandemic, I'm very productive. I hope you are too. I hope everyone is the value of their time. And I find it personally insulting if people constantly send me information that's irrelevant. They haven't taken the time to investigate what I do or they don't value my very specific specialism. So as I mentioned, budget family travel isn't something I cover. It's a very valid way to holiday, but it's not something I cover. So when I get emails about that, it's fine to get one email. If it's followed up, I find that really bad form. My new strategy is I'm just blocking that person. I send them an email and say, uh, you're sending me irrelevant content. You've clearly haven't investigated what I do. I don't have time to read this constantly. So I'm just blocking your email. But <laughs> no, it's really harsh. Uh, but I just want to let you know as a courtesy so you don't do it to the next person. I get hundreds of emails a day. I try and read them all. I'm sacrificing my personal life to do it. So I'm not willing to tolerate that anymore. So just be mindful that travel journalists, and I, I know so many of them, a lot of them really hate their jobs at the moment because they've had two terrible years earning no money with no support. You know, they're not part of the company. Um, and now that things are picking up, they're being assaulted with content or requests to do things for other brands that haven't supported them for 24 months. So uh, be very mindful of those relationships and pay respect to the people you're working with. I also find I'm going to go off on a digression here because I was talking to a travel journalist friend as I mentioned, I don't do as much travel journalism anymore, but many of my friends do. He's been invited on a press trip um, for which he won't earn much money. And although he's agreed to do it, now the club or the, rather the property or the entity he's covering wants him to pay for his train there, uh, pay for the COVID testing he needs to undertake. He needs a special type of insurance because of COVID protocols as well. Accumulation of that is hundreds of pounds 
I don't understand why they expect it to be his responsibility as a freelancer to absorb that because it will nix uh, what he would earn for writing the piece. So I get yeah. really irate on my friend's behalf when I hear of them being disrespected in this way for the very valuable services they're providing. That's just yeah. a little digression. I'm yeah, no, but like you say, it's yeah, yeah, it's good to know, John. I think it is, uh, like you say, there's, there's people, whether it's kind of in a brand, in an agency, and they're just sort of piling back into life as normal or maybe maybe for, for some of them it didn't even it didn't even stop and uh yeah it, you know i think it's it's good to know the feeling at the other end that the example of like blocking blocking people who are sending irrelevant stuff like what a great tip to hear for for someone who's doing that because that they might they might keep sending these things out <laughs> it's great it's really you know it's super helpful because it is that person might still be putting time into sending press releases out and they're just not landing and they're wondering, why am I not getting a response? And then, yeah, it's not because it's, it's not even getting through well, at the, at the you know, side. Um, it's very considerate of you to say they're wondering why they're not getting a response, but actually I don't think they think about it at all. You know, they just assault uh, their mailing list with these completely inane, irrelevant messages. And if they did think about it, if they thought about they were sending it to someone who writes only about luxury travel, and it's about budget family holidays, of course it's irrelevant. So actually, I don't give them credit for thinking about it. If they did, <laughs> they'd perform much more effectively. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So with, with the, just, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey, I like, those are the bits I like to unfill when I'm speaking to people, John, no, it's good. Um, the, in terms of like how to pitch as well, have you got any other recommendations beyond, fi you know, obviously finding the right person and the right topic is, is a good one. Is, are there any other like little secret nuggets from the other side you could give us? Subject lines, like things in the body of the email, like what's the best approach? How, how is that best received from you? You know, you know, when I mentioned earlier about being embarrassed about some of the advice I give, I do feel like everything I say is so obvious. And, you know, there's many people who are great at their jobs who will already know this. But the reason I'm mentioning it is because it doesn't happen the majority of the time. So, you know, if you've got something you're pitching as a story, ensure there's a story there. So I am getting a lot of uh, requests, for example, to write about places just because, you know, we have freedom to travel again relatively um, compared to the last two years. Uh, but, you know, going to a hotel in Portugal for that reason, you, you know, there's no, you, why, there's no story. You know, you need to create something that actually... For me, as a freelancer, if I'm pitching it, I can't go to a prestigious title and say, there's a really lovely safari lodge. Do you want a piece? You know, th there is about 300. So, like, what's the actual aspect here? What are you doing? What's the innovation? Be very considerate as well about why you're engaging with a certain person. Take the time to research. As I, I just, it's a very easy example for me to talk about family travel because I'm definitely disassociated with it and don't care about it. So, you know, if your angle is family travel, who actually has kids or who do you know from, you know, being aware of their social media presence actually likes doing stuff with your nieces and nephews, things like that, do just a little bit of research to show that you really understand the specialism and interests of the person you're hoping to engage with. And then just being efficient. You know, if I, um, respond to something that you've sent me and say, please, can you inform me about this or I need that? Then, you know, we've initiated a conversation, a dialogue that potentially will be fruitful for you and make sure you engage with it. So, um, you know, get back with those requests quickly and ensure that all the resources are already available in place. Like I said, you've already got pictures sorted. You know who's available for interview. If you're inviting people to a property, uh, I don't know if people will be surprised to hear this, but, you know, travel journalists who don't earn much money as freelancers, don't pay their own way to Australia, you know, they'll be reliant on support. So make sure that you've already got that in place and that you don't belittle the person you want to write about it by making them jump through hoops to facilitate the story that you want and the title that they work for. That again goes back to the person I know who's doing this experience, has agreed to do it, and now they've assaulted him with all these additional costs he didn't expect. I just find it so yeah. disrespectful. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else to be aware of in that difference of like freelance writers versus staff writers that you would you would kind of highlight to people? Obviously, if you're pitching a staff writer, what works best? What what should they know? And likewise, what's the difference when they're pitching a freelancer? What are the, what are the considerations people should think about? I think one of the benefits when you're engaging with a staff writer is if they work for Connie Traveller or Rob Report or Country and Townhouse or whatever it is, you know, you're pitching a representative of that publication. 
So you already recognize, hopefully you've cultivated a relationship with the individual and you appreciate them as a person, but you also recognize that they're representing a title that is a certain editorial approach. And you know, for that title, you know, this story, so something about the gardens might be of interest to the country and townhouse or blah, 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 blah. Or it might be wanderlust that is more about intrepid travel or whatever. So you can uh, alter your pitching approach on that basis. With freelancers, ideally, you already understand who they are as individuals as well, and you can be specific in your approach to them, but also recognize the broader uh, reach that a freelancer can potentially come to have means that your story can be repeated again and again and again. So I feel a lot of uh, tour ops or whoever might be allured by the supposed prestige of a person with a very senior title at a reputable, reputable publication, but if they're writing for publication X about that, I mentioned when I was in my previous role, I couldn't write for competitor titles, totally fine for me. But if um, a freelancer is writing about it, they do have that flexibility. So you could see your experience um, replicate it again and again and again in a range of great titles. Or, you know, for me, if because I now through my consultancy work, if I'm working with one of my contacts in Bangkok, you know, they might be the Thailand experts. So that piece can also be integrated into roundups or doing on something else. Or, you know, they'll talk to... Uh, friends of theirs who are booking holidays in the country, just be rec recognized and respect the expertise and very distinct value freelancers give. Um, and also use that opportunity because people are flooded with invitations to do different things um, to immerse this very useful contact in as much of what you offer as possible without exhausting them or completely overloading their itinerary. But appreciate the value that if they've got time they might like to experience something that you know they're not going to write about on this occasion, but it could be useful given that they're there already mm. to ensure that they fully appreciate the value of what you do through a broader range of immersion in what you offer. Yeah, yeah, love it, love it, super tips. Um, so mo moving it on from there a little bit um, and back to, back to you, John, and I guess your experience of starting the business, like you said, it was just before COVID, like you, you went from nice, stable kind of <laughs> life at the Telegraph to start your own thing and then COVID kicked in. What, what did you, like, what did you take from that experience from the last couple of years? Did you, did, what did you, did, did you learn stuff from it? Did you learn stuff about yourself? Like what, when you look back at it, what, yeah, what stands out? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think everyone will answer yes to that question. It was a very, learning experience. I thought COVID was super shit. I don't really like this. When people go on about how wonderful it was to give them a renewed perspective on everything, I thought you don't work in travel, do you? My job was a hundred times harder. Um, it was devastating as well. You know, it's very impactful for all of us individually, but you know, everyone I knew professionally was in complete dire straits and you know, things are better now. Uh, I went to three different countries last month for different uh, tasks, but the, remember there was a time when we had no idea how we would ever recover, right? And I was speaking to hotels in London that were down to 10% occupancy when they would be 80% ordinarily. And this was replicated around the world. So COVID was a really horrible time. I, you know, it was very inopportune that it happened to, to overlap directly with when I established my business you know, um, to do everything oneself as a new business owner in the face of all that, those onslaughts of extreme global challenges that were totally inescapable, it's not like I could concentrate my effort on another market, was very, very draining. Uh, so I wouldn't want to suggest to anyone that, you know, it was okay and I just got through it and everything was fine. It was really, really hard. However, uh, you know, I think for a lot of us, everything else feels very surmountable now in comparison. And um, I also recognize the value of the work I was contributing was really very much appreciated by my clients. Um, it did make a difference and that was good to see as well. Um, and now, as we mentioned at the start of this call before we started recording, you know, things are really, really busy. I'm very pleased to see that. And more broadly as well, there is a recognition, a broader recognition of how valuable travel is just to our well-being and our fulfillment as individuals and that's good for all of us who work in the industry yeah how how do you find the work-life balance i guess now you're getting to a time of a bit of no i mean normality maybe it swung so far the other the other way now but how you know compared to stable job 
like in one place to obviously having to run your own thing. Yeah, how how does work work life balance look after moving to being kind of entrepreneur, running your own running your own thing? Yeah, it's very tiring, isn't it? I, you know, you you find the same thing. I'm sure. You know, I I was never in one place. I was always traveling a lot, but you know, I had one base, and there was just one thing that I was associated with. And there's kind of an insulation that comes from being part of a company that's much bigger than yourself, and just having someone who does all the accountancy and tech stuff versus you know if something goes wrong, I I I have to like engage with all that too. And when you're dealing with global clients across time zones. That's very very difficult on occasion. However, um, it's great as well. You know, it's really exciting to get involved with full flexibility in what interests me. And you know, I'm working in the Middle East at the moment with something that's really inspiring. Uh, I've had clients in the U.S. that have a totally different cultural approach, even though ostensibly you assume they're quite similar. So, you know, it's just constantly stimulating, um, and it's nice as well to engage as a consultant because there's like an embedded appreciation of the value you're providing, and to really have very constructive conversations with people. And one of the things I love most about it as well is just seeing tangible results from what you do because they build something or introduce a concept based on the conversations we have. Um, whereas while I recognize the content I write and wrote has been read and continues to be read by very many people, they don't get back to me and say what their customer journey is from that point onwards. Sometimes people message me on Instagram and say they book stuff based on me having done something on it, but most people don't think to do that. So it's just really nice to have that broader relationship um, through the consultancy stuff um, with the clients I work with. It's, it's, it's fun yeah. at the moment. I can definitely uh, empathise with the frustrations of accountancy and tech and all of those, all of those things. Uh, we've, I mean, I, yeah, we, we've, as we've grown slightly, it's got better, and there's other people that I can, uh, yeah, I can draw on to when I'm when I'm pulling. Well, I've got no hair to pull out anymore. But, but you that's, know, that's where it got when, me you're, to. when you're working globally as well, and you know, every country has a different approach, and you like it, when you're dealing with your client, and they say, "Can you fill that form WXY ten?" And I, this is in Colombia or somewhere like, what is this? Yeah, <laughs> so off to Google. Go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course I'll do that, no problem. And then you've got this impenetrable document in Spanish and I don't have to go to an expat blog or something like that. And I've just got my head in my hands. So actually those aspects, as you know, well, the ancillary aspects of dealing with new clients where you're like, this job will take X amount of time. And you're like, oh, actually I need to add 15% onto that because there's always this bump around it and then you know different cultures as well having a different approach to emailing um, and maybe leaving you waiting a bit longer and stuff like that you know it's it's it's, it's really a, an interesting education yeah yeah I, I mean that was one of the you know when i first started out and it was very much a kind of you know went out to freelance and just do it on my own and i didn't have any sort of dream of building it up and having a team and things like that but it was that those kind of things are the things that then drove that because I was like god I need people to do these things I like I don't want to be in charge of these things so I need uh, I need to get to a point where yeah. I can I can give it to someone else who likes it <laughs> so and exactly and that's the point I'm at now as well you know it's more effective you know thinking about our time as the best most valuable resource we have like I'd prefer to get someone to do this and use my time for something else and then you know sustain my business that way and then kind of attribute yeah. a portion of that revenue this task to someone else are there any yeah. are there any other changes you've made you mentioned i was going to pull it back to your, your comment about time um are there any other changes that you've made to kind of whether from a personal perspective or like you say in the business things that you're, you're starting to change to i guess value to give you more time versus chasing the you know chasing the, the revenue and the the pay packets yeah i think um i don't want to travel as much as i did pre-pandemic i think that's kind of a common uh response you've probably had from other people as well in the recognition that we've realized you know through this period of stagnancy you know i obviously don't want to go back to doing nothing but um i appreciate being selective about where i go and trying to consolidate as many tasks as possible so if I've got a longer term relationship with the client and they want me to experience aspects of, you know, their destination, uh, the tour op uh, services, just do everything in one trip versus coming back a few times. So I will personally try to um, uh, travel less. Um, beyond that, just being selective with who I work with so that we can both benefit from it. I like to contribute to things I believe in and to feel that I can genuinely contribute to. Um, and just working respectfully and happily with people. I think travel is 
are now, again, after a terrible time, it's a fun industry to be in with lots of fascinating people. I feel privileged still to stay in beautiful places and see amazing things. You know, I'm still really excited about it and to share that with other people and make sure whatever working environment I'm in uh, treats everyone respectfully. So, you know, if people sound like they're going to be very hard work or aggressive or something like that, uh, you know, I'm not interested in working with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to be said for not working with bad clients and yeah, sticking stick it stick into a slimmer set of people that are there aligned with what you yeah. wanna what you wanna do. Um, the yeah, I, I think the you know the kind of irony of what you're saying there of you, you you've cut down on the travel. It's like you sort of get into this thing that you're passionate about, and then you get to the point of hang on, this is too much, too far. It, you know, it's one of the things of like follow your passion that almost you, you follow it to a certain extent but then if your passion becomes too much work and too draining then you need it's almost like you, you need to rein it back in there I know other people that I've spoke to who work in football for football clubs or th things like that and it's like oh wow I get to work for Liverpool and and that's the dream from when I was a little boy and then you get there and it's just the nine to five or not the nine to five it's you're getting dragged around all over the place and it loses its allure quite quite quickly so yeah there's a there's a strange balancing act there. Exactly. And, you know, telling people you're a travel writer or a travel journalist at a dinner party sounds like the dream job. And certainly I'm grateful that I did it when I did it. Um, but a lot of these people who continue to do it are traveling alone to very distant places for a very short period of time. They may be somewhere that appears beautiful on Instagram or whatever it is, but um, I don't share pictures of me touring the meeting rooms, you know what I mean? Or like having a two hour conversation with housekeeping about their strategies. You know, it's, and it, you know, I appreciate those aspects of the job, but you know, clearly that's work. That's not being on holiday, right? Then there's um, yeah. just trying to maintain your life back home. A lot of travel journalists struggle with that as well, don't they? You know, relationships, keeping your house in order, going to the gym, being healthy, you know? So, um, just the mundane everyday things that make life a little bit better it can be hard for some people to manage them because yeah, of working yeah in absolutely true yeah are there any like personal qualities you that you think that have kind of helped you to be successful in what you've done whether that's been to kind of move through as a you know in the journalist side of things or then even setting up loot and kind of doing doing what you're not doing now if you like distill that down to certain things is there anything that stands out and you think oh yeah I needed I needed that thing in my personality to make it work. Yeah, I love this question. It's like, what are the best things about you? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Hard to, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that in a way that won't make me sound really irritating. Uh, but I would say generally what I felt my clients appreciate or my professional contacts appreciate is that I genuinely really care about the work I do and being a consultant in this sector, it's not just about saying, let's work with Alan Ducasse or some posh chef for your restaurant, but really trying to consider properly what will contribute in a very positive way to the identity of the property. I hate this kind of knee jerk uh, way of trying to aggrandize yourself by working with, you know, you've got Bulgari toiletries or something like that. I feel it's really lazy uh, in terms of how you can approach building your identity. Um, as I mentioned, trying to just be respectful to the people I engage with. I did tell you that I block emails now, but you know I do send them a courtesy notification for them just to say you know the reason that I'm doing this uh, should hopefully be something you're aware of so you don't do it to other people in the future so you can work more effectively. Um, and then also um, just considering uh, the value of what we do. I don't see travel as a frivolous industry at all. It's a huge global economy you want to work professionally with people doing good work. So it's never about going on the jolly. There needs to be an intrinsic value to what I'm contributing to. And taking that attitude with you just kind of helps you engage in a respectful way with everyone else. But, you know, it, it, more generally, it's hard for me to answer that question because, um, you know, objectively, uh, other people will probably be able to say better what I bring forth. I know my clients are happy, but I'll, I'll have to ask them why that's the yeah, case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's very modest of you, John. I mean, the what, one of the things that stood out to me when you know when we've spoken before and kind of looking at what you've done, and I think it must ring true across people who go into journalism, stay and sort of are successful through journalism, is like 
like resilience and like kind of grit that gets you through doing that because like you were saying when you're juggling a waitering job and free writing and internships and all of those kind of things yeah there's got to be something that kind of gets you whether that's I guess something inbuilt or whether that's something that develops as a result of having to do it in the first place I don't know it's chicken or egg isn't it but yeah well, well thanks Tom and you know it's much nicer to hear you say nice things about me than say them myself <laughs> but you know in relation to that it's the benefit of hindsight um you know, for you fomenting and establishing your business too, I'm sure there are many times when you told like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, it's very, very difficult initially. And now you've reached a point where I can see your office is behind you and you've got staff and, you know, it's paid off. Um, but you don't know at the time. So perseverance is a very difficult thing to have when you're not getting validation or an assurance that it will ever be worth it in the end. I did achieve when I pursued travel journalism as, you know, a young person with zero context in England, in the media, in this country at all. Uh, you know, I got a really good job in the end, but there were many times when I was working at Pizza Express and I was really yeah. questioning my life choices. I think for so many of us during the um, pandemic as well, you know, we had these real existential crises where we had to reassess what we value in life and really ponder whether it was sensible to persevere with travel because you remember a year ago we were locked down in the uk and couldn't do anything and it just feels like it's it, preposterous to believe that was reality now wasn't it but yeah. yeah so persevering was really difficult things are busier now that's great who knows what the future holds for any of us but you know i do believe an integral value of the sector and you know people can be very frivolous about going on holidays but when you go around the world with responsible operators, you know, or hotel groups, you know, with consideration and see the positive impact they can make for local communities, local environments, education, opportunity, you know, it's, it's a really good thing. It can be a really, really good thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is there anything in that, in that uh, vein that you would give, you know, this is a question I asked to everyone of like, what would you say to someone who's going to kind of a thinking about starting their own business, starting about their own, their own travel business? Like what, what, what would you say to them? Is there any advice you'd give to them? Maybe they're early in the journey. Yeah, what, what would you kind of throw in there from, from your experience? I'm going to reiterate what I said at the start and say specifically, if you're thinking of tra travel journalism, I would say don't do it. Sadly, I feel it doesn't pay appropriately. People aren't sufficiently respected. It's extremely hard work, depend, you know, irrespective of how glamorous it might be perceived by other people. Regarding setting up your own travel company, um, find a facet of travel that you're very passionate about because as you know, Tom, you'll have to work extremely hard and it's not a regular nine to five. It's so multifaceted, um, you know, that don't just think you want to sell holidays to Greece. Like what is your identity beyond that? Um, and be pre prepared to pursue it for a long time without getting dividends and hopefully finally it'll work out. But what I would say just generally, uh, in terms of a passion project, it can be so gratifying to work in this sector. Also, what you're doing is really, really special. You know, we've all been kind of through the ringer a bit, haven't we? People are people have been miserable for so long. To just come together with friends or family or your partner or your kids and have a week or whatever it is away from all your worries, somewhere beautiful where you're revitalized is so essential to our sense of well-being, isn't it? So to be the provider that gives that to people through your professional informed approach that respects the value of their time is a really special role to fulfill economically and something you can feel good about. That's what I have to say. Yeah, yeah, love that, love that. Um, and then last couple, just as we close it out there, is, is, there, any, is there any kind of other businesses or, I don't know, like causes or people that, sort of you go to for inspiration that you that you follow that you think are great examples of how to do business do life yeah it might be travel brands that you've worked with i don't know any, anything like that that you'd shine a light on that that you think is a good example for people yeah i i like all the brands i work with because uh, you know i've chosen to do that but uh yeah, again unfortunately i can't highlight any of them specifically because of NDAs and stuff with the projects we're dealing with currently. But, you know, there's so much exciting innovation in this sector. What's interesting now is um, to see how we've adapted our mindset collectively, globally, and engage in much more emotional ways with things. And, you know, every conversation we have now commences with talking about people's mental health and stuff. So this is a growth sector I see in luxury travel and travel more broadly, you know, much more emphasis on well-being 
in a complete holistic sense, you know, so how that's going to modify the SPA concepts you'll see in the future is going to be really, really interesting. I also really like um, travel with purpose, you know, so brands that operate in that sector in the luxury high end would be like Sengisa and people like that who do essential um, conservation work. And when you see the, you know, extremely high rates they charge, but have broader context about the hundreds of thousands of acres that they protect for individual lodges as a result of charging their very privileged, privileged guest treat around the night. It helps to legitimize that. Um, I also, one of the best trips I was on in the last year was at an island in the British Virgin Islands called the Ariel, where a young lady called Brittany Turner was running uh, life coaching courses that were really incredibly inspiring. I like the idea of travel providing us with an opportunity convergence with like-minded people who can stimulate us and help us grow in some way. So that's something I see uh, developing a lot in the travel industry too. Regarding specific brands, um, you know, I really love discovering individual new hotels, people who are doing things purely for the love of it um, and aren't bound by broader corporate restraints in terms of establishing new initiatives and quite, are quite agile. So it's fun for me to work with people like that. Um, I will reference just in terms of innovators, an interesting concept comes from a hotel called 700,000 Hours, the concept being we only have 700,000 hours to live as people on average in you know, Western Europe and civilizations like that. Uh, so when you go there, that they utilize every aspect of your time to its fullest, which again aligns with my um, insistence that my time isn't wasted. So I really like that concept it's yeah. worth looking into and it roves or it wanders from place to place to place. So it stays in all these new locations at the best time to experience them. And you're constantly learning and growing with it. So that's a, a very wow. quick, uh, vague uh, synopsis of just a few things that have immediately come to mind. Yeah, great. No, that sounds really cool. That last one, um, I'll, I'll look that up. And I'll, I will, I'll link to all the things that we've mentioned in the, in the notes for the show at the end as well. So people can go and, go and find them. I'll definitely go and do a bit more, a bit more investigation. That sounds great, John. Uh, great. Listen, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks so much for your for your time. As a, to close it out, tell us a bit more. Like, I guess, look into the future. What have you got planned with the business? How do you how do you want it to go? Do you want it to grow? Do you want it to kind of just be you? What's yeah? Is is there anything on the horizon that, that you'd want to you'd want to share? I, I'd love to sound really strategic and to answer that very convincingly, <laughs> but you know. Um, I'm enjoying the work I'm doing. I have some great clients at the moment. The sector is really, really interesting. Um, and I'm in a privileged position to be able to say that, you know, certainly it wasn't the case for certain points during the pandemic. I was working with people who everyone was furloughed or they closed the marketing department or it was suddenly added to a red list and nobody could go there, you know. Um, so I think this is, you know, everyone's been under immense stress. It's been a very fraught time. I'm happy to see how things are now settling because I think there's still some lack of equilibrium. But over the coming months, I think we'll all have a much more assured sense of what our future as a sector globally might hold. I'm feeling very optimistic, mm. but um, as it stands, I love the consultancy. Uh, I will continue doing some freelance journalism. It's great to have that outlet as well. Um, and I've got some big content projects, so I'm quite busy with those things, but I'm always, Happy to consider new avenues of work. And one of the benefits, as I mentioned, is that I've got this community of people who are contributors to my company. So uh, I can often kind of be a matchmaker for projects like that as well. And funnily enough, one thing that has resulted as well uh, during the pandemic is that I've, funnily enough, through Instagram, quite frequently been approached by people for hotel recommendations. I'm going to mention that the profile is luxury underscore travel underscore editor, luxury travel editor. And... Um, people were con contacting me for hotel recommendations. So I've now actually also started a component of my business, which is booking luxury hotels for people. And um, that's been really, really great as well to uh, directly utilize my first-hand knowledge of some of the world's best properties and be able to advise them in exactly the right place. Because fundamentally, I just love seeing people have a good time. And when I'm booking a hotel for someone, even though it's an ancillary part of my business, I'm just so invested in ensuring like they... Um, they have this suite that's appropriate for them or that they have this experience or like what should we arrange for them and stuff like that it's not necessarily economically very productive for me to do that because i'm like, like essentially just planning everything with them as much as they want but um you know it's just a really good thing to work in travel isn't it you know it's an industry that's centered on making people happy so i'm very pleased to be associated with it, whatever i end up doing 
Yeah, love it, love it. You mentioned you've mentioned so you've mentioned the the Instagram profile there to follow. You mentioned the website obviously is loot l u t e dot co. Anywhere else that people should go to to find you that's good to yeah you want to you want to give a shout out to. Yeah, so I'll, I'll continue to contribute to various titles globally, um, and I do tend to share that content uh, via my Twitter handle or LinkedIn or whatever or Instagram when it's published. But in terms of the things I directly control and do all the time, uh, on Instagram, I document everywhere I tend to go, um, unless it's a really strict non-disclosure thing and I, I can't share anything from the destination at the time. Um, and that's luxury travel editor, luxury underscore travel underscore editor. Uh, I, Loot itself has an Instagram account, which is Loot underscore world, Loot world. Um, and then the Loot website itself is lute.co. And my contact information is there as well, if anyone wants to get in touch to speak more directly about what I do, because it's just really just very general overview and every client is quite different. So there's nothing prescriptive. We just see what works for them and then try to work out if we can do it together. I think that's about it. Yeah, love it. Okay, thanks, John. It's been so nice to speak speak and find out. I, I think the the stories of the glamorous front and amazing things that you've done and, and how exciting that can be, but it's, you know, the context that you've given behind it as well. And obviously the challenges that the industry has and, you know, journalists in particular and writers and things have has been, has been super helpful as well. I'm sure there's loads of things that people who are listening can take away practically to do. Well, you know, my, my focus isn't really to travel journalism so much anymore, as I said. So, but I just wanted to emphasize that point because I'm really aggrieved on behalf of my friends who I see constantly mm. being disregarded in this process, you know, the essential process they play in communicating the stories that I as a consultant help a brand to develop, you know? Um, you know, they're so vital to that process being a success. So I, I just, on their behalf, wanted to mention that. Uh, I think it's important to yeah. consider. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I'll be, I'll certainly be following along and, and hopefully have have many more conversations with you in the future. I'll, I've, yeah, this question's going around in my head as to how we we could maybe work with you in, in different ways to get get some help and advice. So, uh, so yeah, wish you all the best with it. Thank you, Tom. And it's exciting because there's, we're a creative industry with so many ideas kind of paying off each other. And then you have these contexts and these conversations and it results in all these unexpected things because everyone in travel is open-minded, right? So it's a great way to pursue your life professionally. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, it's been a pleasure having you. Thanks so much, John. All the best. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that one and you enjoyed listening to John as much as I did talking to him. Even as someone that's immersed in the marketing industry, I always find new nuggets to take away from these kind of chats and that was definitely no exception. You can find John on the various social channels that he mentioned, which I'll link to in the notes, along with the various loot accounts that you can follow too. There's also loads of other resources in these show notes too, including the cool examples John mentioned of things that he's done, brands that he loves, and I'm sure that stuff will be helpful for anyone that enjoyed the conversation to dig further. All of those show notes and the links are at seotravel.co.uk forward slash John O. Kelly. That's J-O-H-N hyphen O hyphen C-E-A-L-L-A-I-G-H. I best not have got that one wrong or I'll be getting chastised by John, as you'll have heard in the conversation. You can also watch the video of the conversation there, or you can visit seotravel.co.uk forward slash podcast for all the other episodes so far, where you can get lots of other insight too. If you're a hotel or a travel company looking for marketing support from people who really care about your success, then please do get in touch at seotravel.co.uk and we'd love to hear from you. You can also read more about our 100% initiative there, which outlines how we give all the profit we make from the business to educational charities, both at home and around the world. We'd love your support in spreading the world so that we can help these charities do as much as possible. If you enjoyed the show, it would be wonderful if you could review us on iTunes and share what your favorite bits were there, subscribe to the show, and if you could share it with at least one person you know who could benefit from the, epi uh, from the episode and the insight that John offered, that would be tremendous. If you haven't already, then please do give our other episodes a listen. We've had some fantastic stories from guests through season one and also through season two and still more to come. So stay tuned for future episodes coming up. And when you do subscribe, you'll get notified when we release those new episodes so you can be one step ahead of the game. Other than that, thank you so much for listening. We really do appreciate it. And until next time, 
Happy travels!